choir sang earlier, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have his, <clears throat> be his than riches untold. Man, I mean, just to think of the relationship as Christians that we have with the Father is amazing. And so, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Acts with me. Um, I began to think about my message. You know, pastor had contacted me and said that with a lot of the situation going on with his house and stuff, he wasn't going to be able to be here today. And he asked me if I could uh, preach for him today. And I was, what a privilege. You know, last time I, was, I stood before you all was before I left for the summer. And the last time I really got an opportunity to preach was over the summer when I stood before hundreds of kids at camp and I shared the God, God's word. I shared with them about the gospel. And, and I encouraged them, I challenged them to live for Christ in the midst of all that, that was going on in the world today. And that's kind of where we're headed today. So when I was thinking about this message, I started to think of one message. And I started to prepare that message. And as I was preparing it, I just said, you know what, the Lord, this just isn't the message. Like, I, I'm, this is a great message, but I'm just, it's not the message I need. You know, when I, when I do a message, I want it to be what, a message I need at that moment. Something that's going to convict me that the Holy Spirit's going to challenge me at that moment. And the Lord changed that, and he began putting on another message on my heart, and I began to work on that. And the very first thing that, that came to my mind was the word fear. When I say the word fear, what comes to mind? A lot of times it's what scares us the most. When I say, what am I scared of? Am I scared of spiders? Yes, I'm scared of spiders. I will be honest with you. When I see a spider, it is not a little spider. It is a spider this big, and it's about to attack me. There was a time when there was this big spider in our bathroom, and Lydia yelled for me, and I came in there, and I said, what is it? And she's like, there's a spider. And I said, that thing is huge. I'm not touching it. I swear that thing was this big. <laughs> to her, it was this tiny, but to me, it was like this massive thing, and spiders scare me. I have fear of spiders. Maybe fear of being alone scares you. Is it the fear of heights? I hate heights. I prefer not to go up a building if I don't have to. I prefer not to get on an elevator if I don't have to. But is that your fear? What about death? Does death fear you? I know when I was younger and I thought about death, it wasn't where I was going because I knew I was a child of God and I knew where I would go, but the fear of leaving my parents behind and leaving my toys. Isn't that sad? When you're a child, the only thing you think about is, I'm going to leave all these toys behind. What, what's going to happen to them? I can't take them with me because I know, you know. And I had that little bit of fear of death. And it wasn't the death of not knowing Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It was the fear of leaving my loved ones behind. <laughs> What would life be like when I'm not here anymore? But do you know what, what the big thing that people fear the most is? And that is public speaking. Man, I remember when I first preached, I was so nervous and I was so scared. I began to like hold on to the, the pulpit real tight. You know, I think when I got done, there was imprints on my hands. I think they dedicated it to me after I was done because of my, my fear. And it's, and it's kind of a fear of all of us. We all have a fear of public speaking, whether you're publicly speaking amongst a crowd or if you're just having a few people that you have to share an announcement with, we all have that fear. You know, as I, I've gotten older, I've, my fear of speaking isn't as, as bad amongst a, a crowd of you all. But for younger kids, my fear of speaking in front of them gets to me every single time. Why? Because I'm fearful of what I may say. Will they laugh at me? Will they think I'm not cool? Will they snicker behind my back? I shouldn't allow those things to bother me, but I do. It's the fear of not knowing or the fear of, of getting the material or the, what I want to say wrong. Maybe the fear today is the fear of what comes on the news. You know, in our house, we, we don't have uh, cable or anything like that, so we never see what's on the news until someone tells us or, or my phone goes off because the, the Fox News app told me something had happened and, and things like that. So I never know what's happening. But maybe for people who watch the news, it's the fear of what is happening outside in our community and in our nation and around the world today. Do you know on October 1st in 2000? 
15 at UCC and it's a college in Oregon. There was a young man on the campus and he had multiple guns and he had one sinister mission. And that mission was to, to eliminate everyone who claimed to be a Christian. He went up to every student, he went up to every staff, and he asked them one question, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if they replied yes, he stuck the gun in their face, and he said, you will meet him in one second. And nine people that day died standing for Christ. I mean, sorry, I'm getting emotional, but that should, have, that should dwell in us to realize, am I standing for Christ? If I had a gun in my face and was asked that very question, do you believe in Jesus Christ, would I have said yes? When I think back to when I was a, a teen, I would have found a way and a loophole to avert it, the question so that it didn't come out that I was a Christian, but that I was a Christian, but they wouldn't have known that I was a Christian because of the fear that the gun was going to kill me instead of standing there and saying, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I will die for him. Yes, I would have found a way to gotten out of it. But these nine people stood for Christ and knew that it was going to happen. So the question is, would you be afraid in that moment? Is there a time in your life that you would say, yes, I would have been afraid, not today, because I know that I want to stand for Christ. Or maybe today you're saying, yeah, if I stood there and somebody put a gun to my head and asked me if I believed in Jesus Christ, I would have a fear to tell them yes, because I know what was going to happen. Fear affects us in several ways. One way that it affects us is that when we need to speak up, we keep quiet. Another way that it fear uh, um, gets a hold of us is when we need to move, we stand still. Another way that it, it, it hinders us is we need to move forward, we retreat. When the battle gets too much for us to handle, what do we do? We retreat back because we allow fear to hinder us. But you know what fear really does to us as Christians? It keeps us from speaking boldly for Christ. Our fear keeps us from living boldly for Christ. It stops us from sharing our faith with those that we come in contact with. We lose focus on the clear gospel message. God's salvation unto us by his son's death, burial, and resurrection but we allow the fear to hinder us from, from sharing that with others. This evening, I want to go more in depth of our, our fear. Today, I want to look at a, a person that God had put into his word to, to teach us about boldness. And many times when, I, when we think of, of a person, Paul comes to mind. We think of Paul because he was bold. In the midst of his trials and tribulations and everything that he was going through, he stood for Jesus and was bold. But I want to look at somebody different today. I want to go to the book of Acts in chapter 6. We're going to look at Stephen's life. Stephen was a man who, who, allow, who didn't allow fear to keep him from speaking boldly. He didn't fear death. Stephen loved Jesus Christ enough that he stood for God and for Christ. And that's why I want to look at it. Even in the difficult circumstances that we're going to look at, he still knew that it was the right thing to do was to, to preach the gospel in any moment that he had the opportunity. So if you're in uh, chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, In those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmur of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in a daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not, it is not reason that we should live, leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look, out among, look, out, look ye out among seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom you may appoint over the business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. <clears throat> and the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for being the almighty God that we need, Father, in our lives. 
in the midst of our, our rags and our, and our disgust, Father, you loved us enough to send your son. And he willingly chose that cross and shed his blood for our forgiveness of sins. Father, and I pray today as we look at the life of Stephen that we can, we can walk away realizing, Father, that we want to be a Stephen in our life and stand boldly for you. And we ask this all in your son's precious name, and we pray, amen. First part that we're going to look at here, Stephen, is, is the character of who he was. And think about it, um, there's a problem here that has rose in the church, and, and the men uh, are called together, and they realize that this problem. So what do they do? They, they, they talk to each other, and they say, we need to find a man full of uh, uh, faith and the Holy Ghost. But before we do it, before we just look out amongst the crowd, let's go to the Lord in prayer. He went, they went to God, and they prayed earnestly, Father, reveal to us the, man that you, the men or men you choose that you can lead this uh, church at, in a mighty way. You know, many times we... We, we allow problems to rise in our, in our lives, and the first thing we do is not go to God in prayer, but we go to our neighbors or we go to our friends, and we, we talk about it instead of saying, God, let me get on my hands and knees and, and pray out to you and, and seek your guidance in this problem that I'm going through and the boldness that I need to speak truth. When you think about character, um, character is, is who you are when no one is looking. And it becomes evident when people are watching. One thing that Lydia and I like to do when we go out on dates is we'll go out to eat. And even before we even got engaged, we went out to eat and we started this, this whole thing of like watching people, what they were doing, what they were eating. And we would come up with little storylines like, oh, that, that person is a doctor or that person's a teacher or that person drives this type of car. Or they drive this type of car. And then we begin to say, this is the conversation they're having. They're asking each other, like, they're on their first date like we are. And they're asking, how many kids do you want? And do you love me? Do I look pretty? Is my hair fine? You know? And it became something that we, we do now on a, on a date. It's becoming like one of those things where we, we can go to McDonald's and sit there and we will, we will envision the life of, of somebody else, of what their life is like. But you know what? One thing that we do also talk about is, does that person know Jesus Christ? Do they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You only see them for a split second, so I can't tell you what their character is based on, on, on a life of what their character looks like. I can only base it on what I see at that moment. And sometimes we'll see them bow their heads and they pray, and you think, it's possible they are Christian because they prayed. They prayed over their food. So character is, is who we are when no one is looking, but it comes evident when those are watching us. When I think about the character of, of myself, and maybe you're thinking about your character of, of how, you, how you've been living your life and think about it like, man, if I went over to Oberlin or if I went to Wellington and, and acted as somebody else then then came to church every Sunday and was this character... Would, would people begin to understand the message that I would be giving them? Would they, would they see me and say, wow, the message that he preached doesn't match the character that he is living? It is amazing how many times I've gone far away and ran into somebody that I knew, not realizing they were in the same location I was in. And they're like, wow, don't you live in New London? Like, and I'm like, yeah, how do you know? Oh, well, my grandmother lives in New London, or my grandparents live, or, or this person, or that person, or I, I've been to your church once or twice, and you're thinking, man, like, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you, and I don't know your name, but wow, like, they knew me. They were watching me. They knew my character. So if I would have been far away thinking like no one's going to know if I do this or do that because no one from church is going to see me, but then realize that people are watching you. People who know you, who may not know you personally, but know you, and they're out and they see you, they're watching the character of who you are. So if, if I'm living one life in one place and I begin to try to share the gospel with them, but they know me from being the youth pastor at First Baptist Church, are they going to believe what I have to share with them? Are they going to question it? 
begin to say, you preach this, but yet you live like this. How can that be true? I think about my time when I was in high school. I shared with you guys earlier that if there was ever a time in high school, I would have found a way to deny, but yet believed in Christ because I was wanting to be part of the cool crowd. And I would go to church on Sunday, and I'd go to church on Wednesday, and I would go to the youth events, and I would live a character of what they saw me as. But when I was in school, I was a different character. I didn't live for Christ. If I was challenged in, in high school and through my youth group to go and share Christ with my friends in high school, would I have been so boldly or would I have allowed fear to hinder me because I realized that my character doesn't match what the gospel has me. My character is not matching the Chris Lopez here in church. So how can I go to them and tell them about Jesus Christ? It's a realization that I would have to, to ask and seek forgiveness, not just from those of the way I've been living, but from God himself. When we look at Stephen's life, we see that Stephen lived godly. And those people respected him and promoted him. It says that in verse 5, it says, They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. When we think about it, Stephen shone brighter even through the scariest of situations, which we will look, for, look further in, uh, in Acts 6 to see what that is. When we think about it, there really, uh, Stephen had a good reputation. He was well, well respected. There was nothing, nothing, anything, anyone could say negative about Stephen. Even though when you look further down in, in Acts 6, we, say, we see where witnesses came forward and falsely accused him of something that wasn't true, they still could not come and say anything negative other than the lies that they were told to tell. When we think of reputation, sometimes it takes us a lifetime to build a reputation. But do you know it only takes a second of stupidity to ruin your reputation? I had a professor in college once who was talking about reputation and character, and he said, you know what, there's going to be unbelievers who are going to try and destroy your reputation when you are in ministry or if you are uh, a, a, a deacon or something like that. The unbelievers will try and destroy that, that reputation that you, that you have built. But you know what, if your character matches the gospel message and God's word, they can never destroy that character of who you are. And others will know your character. But only you can destroy your character and your reputation by, the, by your stupidity, by your foolish ways. Man, that, that was hard. Like, when I first heard that, I was kind of like, I, I, I don't get it. I'm not understanding. But I understand when you see Stephen and he lived for God and he stood for God, not even the witnesses that came forward could even tarnish his reputation because his character was that he believed and loved in God alone. When you think about it, Stephen's reputation wasn't built on something that he had done. His reputation was built on the obedience to God's word and his relying on God and the Holy Spirit who dwelt among him. When you think about it, we even see where he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a man with the presence of God who dwelt in him. As you and I know, the moment of salvation, the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone, the Holy Spirit dwells among us and inside of us. I have the boldness and I don't have to fear anything. Because why? Because God is already in the midst of me. He is already dwelling in me. And even Stephen understood that. He grasped it. God tells us that believing by faith on the name of Jesus Christ at the moment that Spirit will dwell within each of us. But sometimes the reason that, that all of the unbelievers have fear is because the God doesn't dwell in them. They fear the, the ridiculous things. They fear death. So I shared with you earlier, I fear death on, on a different reason. But they fear death because they don't know where they're going. They don't know that they can have a choice between heaven and hell. Because why? Because no one is coming to them to share the gospel, the good news of salvation unto them. But we see Stephen was a bold man. He, was, he had a good reputation. He was full of the Holy Spirit. We look at Galatians 5.16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
when we live by the Spirit, we obey Him. We obey the Holy Spirit. I was the, even talking with Genevieve this weekend because she had gotten in trouble. And, and we were talking about Scripture and we were talking about God's Word. And I said, Genevieve, I said, before you did what you did, did you know it was wrong? And she said, yeah, I knew it was wrong. And I said, well, why do you know it's wrong? Well, she knows that the Holy Spirit dwells in her because she is a child of God. And she knows that the Holy Spirit was convicting her, telling her, don't do it because you know it's wrong and you'll know you'll get in trouble. But yet she still chose to be disobedient. Scripture tells us that, that if we walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we, when we have the Spirit dwelling in us, we obey God's Word. And we see that Stephen walked by the Spirit. And he was wise. So we see that he had a good reputation. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was also full of wisdom. He didn't make foolish decisions. I tell you, when I was younger, I'm still kind of young, but when I was younger, I made some foolish decisions. When I was in college up in New York, they have the, these places that you can go and you can do rock climbing and mountain climbing and all this stuff. And I decided it'd be a great thing to go out one day in the morning. I said, you know what, I'm going to go to this high peak and I'm going to conquer it. You know, it's, it's a three and a half mile hike up this mountain, but by the time you get to top, the, the view is breathtaking. And I got there and I decided that, you know what, I could take the trail or I can take this one trail that seems to be shorter, but the only thing is you have to face climb this mountain outside of a waterfall to get to the top. And so instead of me taking the long way, I thought I'm going to take the easy route. And some friends of mine were with me and we all decided, like, let's do it. Like we can, like we, we've seen videos of people rock climb and it's, there's nothing to it. You just find the little crack and you pull yourself up. So we're, we're working on it, you know, and I tell you all of a sudden one guy grabbed a rock and it came flinging down because he grabbed a loose one and I had to swing out from it hitting me. Well, before I knew it, I had to let go and I falling from this cliff and I'm thinking like, this is ridiculous. We didn't tell anybody where we're going. We made a foolish decision. What are we thinking? Luckily, the Lord was with us that day and protected us, but it was a foolish decision. Were we using a wise counseling? The wise thing would have been for us to use the route that would have been a little bit longer. The wise decision would have been said, hey, we need to tell people where we're going in case we don't show back up in college. So they know where our car will be and what mountain we're climbing and probably to find us along the trail, not this trail that most people didn't take. But it was a self, it was a unfoolish, it was a foolish, this is not unfoolish, it was foolish. When you think about wisdom is to keep us from clearly, um, when we have fear that overpowers us, it, it keeps us from clearly sharing the gospel through wisdom. As we said earlier, the good news of God's salvation. But we also know in Proverbs 9:10 it says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Stephen feared the Lord. Do you fear the Lord today? It's the beginning of wisdom. Not the fear of the Lord because, because of, of, of anything other than the, the love that we have from knowing that he is an almighty, powerful God who loves us. When you think about it, man, I, I, I think about the universe. And I was watching this video and it was showing the, the, the constellation and the stars and the galaxies. And it was talking about how far each one was and how far the sun and, and this massive galaxy. And scripture tells us that, that he holds it in his hands. He holds it in his hands. He holds you in his hands. You are precious to him. Stephen was precious to God, and Stephen willingly chose to be bold and stand for God in the midst of his trials. But not only that, but Stephen was full of faith. We know Hebrews 11 tells us, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I sat in that bench earlier today and I faithfully trusted the carpenter who built that bench to hold me and that I was not going to fall. But sometimes we have trouble even putting our faith in Jesus Christ that he is in control. Man, I tell you, this week when I was talking with the Ziegler family on the phone and they were talking about their trials and the pain and the hurt, 
You know what really came out through that? It was the faith they had in God alone, that he was going to heal their son's body, that their son was going to leave that hospital one day. I was like, wow, I'm, t- I, I'm taken by this. Here's this family who is hurting and going through a lot, but yet they have so much faith in God. And sometimes I think my faith is very tiny. When I should have this massive faith in knowing that, that God is in control. Sometimes I feel like I do have a massive faith. You know, all of you know that we just had a little bundle of joy. And my grandmother was supposed to come and stay with us, but she was too worried of, of the baby getting sick. And if the baby got sick, it, it could have been something she would have brought or it could have been something her, uh, you know. And so I, I began to, to think and I told her, I said, there's nothing to fear because God is in control. And if that baby is meant to get sick, whether you were here or you're not here, that baby was going to get sick. So why should I fear in what I know that God is in control? You know, as I was talking to the Zeeler family and they were talking about the loss of, ch- of a child and I told them, I said, I don't know what you're going through because I personally have not lost a child. So I don't know what you're going through. I know grief. I know pain. I feel the hurt of any, ch- any person who loses a child or a loving or, or any of that. But I don't know what you're going through. But I pray that my faith in God will be so tremendous that even through the heartache and the brokenness, I can still trust in God that he is in control. That he had this for a reason. He had it for a plan. And there's no need for me to doubt that. Stephen lived a life of faith in such a way that it was evident to the fact that God was alive. So we looked at Stephen's character and it directly influenced those around him and and actually influenced the witnesses. He allowed the gospel to transform his life in a mighty way. Sometimes I wonder, are we also living in that same way? You know, when I think of, 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 char- of uh, Stephen's character, it also brings about another part of, of Stephen, because Stephen was a soul winner. When you look at the verses, it says in, uh, in verse 7 of, of chapter 6, it says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great com- uh, company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen was a soul winner. He went out amongst them and, and went out to reach them. When you think about it, God has called us all to go out and share the gospel. It's not the job of the pastor. It's not the job of the deacons. It's not the job of the missionary. We are commanded by scripture to go out and spread the gospel, the good news. But fear stops us from sharing it. Tonight we're going to look at a little bit more about fear and how it hinders us from sharing the gospel with others. And even tonight as we come back to this message and we begin to to look at it even more, we'll even talk about the boldness of Stephen in this midst of of the trials that he was going through. When you think about it, tonight we're going to look at of a choice. We can either choose to be bold or we can choose to be fearful and to retreat, to run, to hide, to say, you know what, we'll let somebody else do that. When you think about it, we all have loved ones who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Family members, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephew, nieces. We have our neighbors. Do we look upon our neighbors with compassion the way Jesus Christ did when he looked out upon the multitudes that were coming to him and he had compassion for them because he saw that they were lost sheep without a shepherd? We need to have that compassion. We need to pray to God on our faces and say, God, give me the boldness that I need to share your gospel. I need the boldness to be not fearful, but to be fearful. And I began to, to realize in this message as I, as I was thinking through the past year of 2019 and going into the 2020, I started thinking like many times we make resolutions. 
for the ball drops, we say, this year's resolution is I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to eat healthy or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. As Christians, what do we do? We say that for the new year, I'm going to read, be in God's word more often. I'm going to pray more often. What happens a couple days after it? We, we start out strong and we're doing so well. And what happens? We allow the things of life to get into the midst of things and we forget to pick up our Bible and read it. We forget to pray. And then we go, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, what happens? I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, what happens? I'll do it tomorrow. Before you know it, 365 days went by and you're saying, oh, wow, I didn't do what I planned for 2019 or 2020. So now I'll do it for 2021. No, God wants you to do it now. God wants you to have an in-depth personal relationship with him as Stephen did. To know his word. To love him. To fear him. To, to share him. As we get ready to close this message, and we'll come back tonight, and we'll look at it even more. The piano is going to begin to play. I just want us to begin to think. Have I allowed fear to hinder my my time with God? Have I allowed fear to hinder my ability to go out and share the gospel message? If I stood before a man and was asked, do I believe in Jesus Christ? And I knew that was the moment that, that I was going to be with God in his presence when I stood and stood strong for God and for Christ alone. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, as you guys stand up and as the piano begins to play, as we looked at Stephen's life and, and the character of who he was, the reputation he led. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, Pastor Chris, I, I need to live boldly for God. I need to, to give all that I have for God. And if that is you today, I just want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor Chris, pray for me. Pray that I will be bold amongst the family, amongst those that don't know you as their personal Savior. And I'll pray for you. All right, I see those hands. I will pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Chris, I can't live boldly because why? I have not put my faith in Jesus Christ alone. I put my faith in, in works and trying to work my way and pay my way to heaven, but I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ alone today. Maybe that's you. If that is you, if you just slip over here, I want to pray for you. If that is you, that you realize that I need to put my faith alone in Jesus Christ today. As the piano is playing, if the Lord is speaking to you, I want you to come down to this altar and ask God to, to seek your heart and to reveal, to give you the boldness knowing that he dwells amongst you.